You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast, and I have uh, Dr. Barry Raphael. Uh, he's a DMD and orthodontist, and we're going to be talking about uh, how he works and treats crooked teeth uh, through a, a bunch of mechanisms promoting healthy breathing, posture, nutrition, sleep, and et cetera. So, uh, Dr. Raphael, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Good, Richard. Hey, listen, I want to tell you how much I enjoy your show. I have been listening to oh. uh, a number of the podcasts including the one with Ted Belfour, who's thinking very much parallels mine. Um, I was just listening to the guy with the um, the uh, sleep monitor l- measuring micro movements. I think this is a, mm. uh, uh, a, a wonderful concept because as we're going to talk about today, the quality of breathing during the night is critical. It's a critical component of what I do. It is a It is one of the major symptoms that I look at in both treatment planning and outcome measuring in my um, in my orthodontic practice now. Yeah, the thing that struck me before I started talking to uh, you know orthodontists and dentists like you is I thought dentistry had nothing to do with sleep. Then I learned, you know, there's some dentists that will give you a uh, you know a, a lower jaw advancement appliance to try to help with apnea. But then it went a level deeper, and I didn't realize that some dentists are looking actually at the structure of the face and the jaw and uh, going into a lot more detail with myofunctional therapy and things like that. So right. what was your evolution? Did you just start dentistry wanting to be a dentist or an orthodontist, or what happened to your practice over the years? Gosh, if you want to go back to the beginning, I really wanted to be a rock musician. But once I started making money at, at, with music, it lost all its charm for me. Um, well, I, I, I was trained as a, a dentist. I practiced general dentistry for a few years. I went back into a residency for orthodontics, uh, influenced heavily by my dad, who was an orthodontist. Um, uh, we did go into practice together for a while before he retired. And uh, really, for the first 27 years, I was doing conventional orthodontics, you know, always looking for a better way of doing things, trying new techniques, trying to make things more comfortable, more efficient, safer, and, and whatnot. But about uh, 10 years ago, while uh, after I was having what is normally a very typical problem in orthodontic practice, which is having um, getting towards the end of the treatment and not being able to get the top and bottom teeth together well enough because the tongue is getting in the way. And when you mentioned myofunctional therapy, this is kind of the crux of the matter that the tongue has to have proper rest posture. In other words, when you're not particularly doing anything with your mouth, your tongue needs to be resting on the palate. Um, And this is true from birth onward. Um, And then during function, which is, you know, eating and drinking and talking and and so forth, um, it has to have a certain mechanical stability and balance so that it could perform all those functions properly. But very often, that's not the case for a lot of people. And um, the, the orthodontists typically don't notice it until the end of treatment when they're all of a sudden having this tug of war 
with um, an organ that we typically don't really even pay much attention to in our classical training. And so, so the, we... The tongue is considered to be an organ, by the way? Well, yes, I, it is. It's a, it's a series of muscles, but it has a, uh, a function that I would say more complex than just moving bones. And um, uh, I, I, I call it an organ. I don't know technically whether that's, that's true or not, but look, it, it is, um, it is uh, the function for eating and controlling foods and liquid. It is the um, functional component of speech by and large, but even more so it is both the protector and the regulator of the airway. And so its uh, it, its function is uh, is critically important, but most dentists are really not taught much about it at all, except how to keep it out of the way while they're working on the teeth. Right. And the orthodontists generally are not much of an exception to this. I mean, in my orthodontic residency back in the 80s, we we actually had a course in myofunctional therapy, but it was one of those uh, peripheral add-on courses that. Uh, I'm going to say we didn't pay a whole lot of attention to because we were so involved in the mechanics of pushing teeth around the jaws. So 10 years ago, I'm struggling with an open bite caused by a tongue thrust, and I know what it is. And I sit down for lunch, and I read this article by um, uh, Herman Ramirez, who is a dual specialist orthodontist pediatric dentist now up in Canada. And he said something that kind of tickled my brain a little bit and um, made me rethink um, many of the orthodoxies that I was carrying with me from my orthodontic training. And that is, he said, um, the um, uh, soft tissue dysfunction is the etiology of malocclusion. Now, so we'll parse that out a little bit. Soft tissue dysfunction, by and large, means the functions of the tongue. And, uh, you know, including um, the lips, the chin, the cheeks, the, the neck, the, all the chewing muscles and all that, you know, that in, the, in the head and even upper quarter. And actually, since I learned this article, really extending all the way down to the feet, um, there can be imbalances which are going to affect the growth of the face and the position and uh, organization of the tongue and all that. But when he said it was the etiology of malocclusion, and for your listeners, by the way, malocclusion simply meaning uh, crooked teeth, that was going a step farther than I had ever really thought about before. Because while I was concerned about soft tissue dysfunction at the end of orthodontic treatment, if the tongue was not fighting me in any way, then I didn't really much care about it. In other words, if I could get straight teeth, and by and large, you know, we can in most cases, then, um, you know, the, let the tongue have its way. It doesn't really matter. The tongue, what is the tongue capable of doing over time in someone's mouth? I don't think people are aware of what it can do. Well, see, here's the crux of the matter. And, and that is um, the, not, not just the function of the tongue, but the rest posture of the tongue is critical for the shape and size the jaw bones eventually take. Um, in growth and development. And this is, this is really what Ramirez was alluding to when he said that uh, soft tissue dysfunction is the etiology of malocclusion. What he was saying is that the rest posture of the tongue and then also the functions of the tongue ultimately determine, number one, how well the jaws grow, number two, how well the teeth come in, and then what he didn't say at the time, but what I've learned since, is how well the airway takes its shape. Now, by airway, I'm talking about from the tip of the nose to the bottom of the throat, um, once you get into the, uh, past the larynx and into the bronchi. And the, sh the ultimate shape of the nasal airway, the throat passage of air, at the top of the throat, behind the, the soft palate and the, the adenoids, at the bottom of the throat, behind the tongue and where the tonsils are, all that depends upon how good the function of the tongue is. Now, this is a very different concept because up to this point, I was believing that the shape of the face was largely genetic and that the shape of the face and the jaws and the way the teeth came in, you got from your parents or maybe some combination of parents. 
you know, in the Grand Canyon, water has carved it away over millions of years. I don't know if this is a ridiculous comparison, but if the tongue is in a certain spot versus another spot that changes the airflow through your nose and through your mouth, do you think the airflow itself can shape the airway over a period of years? Or is that not possible? It does to a certain extent, but the primary factor here, Rich, is that the tongue serves as the biological scaffold over which the upper jaw grows. So, um, you know, just, just, it's not even a metaphor. I mean, it's, it's, it's the analogs and all the rest of our skull, the bones take shape because of the tissues that surround them, the forces that are occurring and the functions that occur. For instance, the shape of your skull is determined by your brain. N- not the, the brain doesn't go, grow into a genetically determined skull. Um, In fact, if you opened a skull and looked inside, you would see the indentations of uh, blood vessels and, and, um, and structures of the brain and so forth. Our orbits take the shape of the eyeballs, not the eyeballs growing into the orbit. The nose and what we call the nasal capsule, which includes the nose and then all the sinuses that surround it, they are, in fact, influenced by the flow of air. Uh, around it. The Hmm. the skin that that lines the sinuses is stimulated by airflow. It it creates a reaction underneath the linings of the bones that stimulate growth in different directions. And then this tongue being a scaffold, meaning that as it rests up on the palate, the palate literally takes the shape of the tongue. And if the tongue is up Mm -hmm. there, the arch form will tend to grow broad and wide with uh, not only straight teeth, but enough room for 32 teeth. You may not have known this, and a lot of people don't really question it much anymore, including Dennis, but the human animal up to about the last four or 500 years has had room for 32 teeth. That's what our genetics is programmed for, 32 teeth. That includes wisdom teeth. Now, if you were to ask people if they had enough room in their head for 32 teeth, 80% will tell you no, the, the wisdom teeth got impacted. They had to have them removed, usually prematurely, as our practice is. And, and it's, that has nothing, nothing to do with the, those last four teeth and has everything to do with the fact that the container that holds, the teeth, that holds those teeth never developed fully enough to accommodate them. I think the, so, uh, the amazing thing here is that you're saying all over the body, soft things can move and influence and shape hard things. The brain influencing the skull, the tongue influencing the mouth and throat. That's that's amazing. Richard, we've known this for hundreds of years. Uh, In the the 19th century, um, Wolf's Law said that um, bone will take its shape, its size, its hardness from the functions that surround it. There even orthodontists that are more enlightened than I, and that have been uh, talking about this for longer than I, than it took me to realize it, um, is that when it comes to a tussle between bone and muscle, muscle will always win. Hmm. I, di- I didn't intend for that to rhyme like that, but that may help us <laughs> may help us re- uh, better. remember it. Yeah. Um, hmm that bone bone is is programmed to grow but it's not the 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 genetics of bone is not precise enough to determine its its ultimate shape it takes cues from its environment as to which uh bone cells will um will generate new bone and which ones will um eat away old bone and how that remodeling process of building bone and taking bone away goes on. And that's true from birth onward or, well, prenatally. Um, It's true at birth. It's true during the growth years of childhood. But it's equally true um, all the way up to late stages of, of life. Our bones are living tissues. They turn over um, continuously over periods of time. It's a little slower than a lot of other tissues turn over, but it's still, they turn over. The cells that you have in your bones now are not the same cells you've had just some time ago. 
And so there's an opportunity to take advantage of that biology by structuring the environment in which these bones grow. And when I, again, when I, alluding back to that Ramirez article, what it told me was that if soft tissue dysfunction creates bad growing bones, then proper function can create proper bones. And this is really the essence of the myofunctional therapy is that if you can change the equilibrium and homeostasis around a bone, it will grow better than it otherwise would have. It'll meet its genetic potential. But that's not, that is generally not what is happening in modern society. And certainly anybody with crooked teeth, that's not what's happening. And so as an adult, can you change with uh, your proper tongue posture? Can you change the structure of your mouth and throat and nose, especially if you have sleeping issues? Yes. The general answer is yes. You may not be able to change it dramatically with exercise alone. Um, you may have to use some structural modalities to undo the damage that's been there for years and years. But you can't successfully complete the case nor maintain the case unless you've changed the muscular balance and habit. This is a fallacy of orthodontics is that, um, you know, orthodontics straightens your teeth. But it, it, it actually takes teeth out of their natural balance and puts them into an artificial place, a place we call straight. Now, straight teeth has its advantages and it looks nice to us and our culture and all that. But everybody knows that when you take braces off, you have to put retainers on, right? And if you don't wear your retainers, your teeth go back and your orthodontist will blame you for not wearing your retainer. But the truth is that orthodontics generally doesn't really even address soft tissue function from the beginning and doesn't usually cor correct it unless it happens to correct by happenstance, which can happen just by changing, you know, the shape of the structure. But for the most part, we, we really have not paid adequate attention to function, how it creates the problem, and then how, to, how we change it so we can create a new uh, balance. And yes, this balance so, uh, can be achieved in adults just as well as it can in kids. So now, nowadays, you know, uh, a teenager or a kid comes to you, the teeth are crooked. Typically, the parents are waiting to hear from you, well, he needs braces, and the kid would be put into braces. What do you do differently now? Do you instead prescribe exercises and that corrects and eliminates the need for braces, or how do you do things differently? Well, first of all, Richard, let's start with a new um, way of looking at things. I no longer wait. To put kids in braces. Waiting to ki put kids in braces is like waiting to put out a fire when it, until it reaches the roof. I mean, you, you, you don't want to just stop a fire from happening. You want to get to it as quickly as, as possible. And really, you really want to be safe. You want to prevent it from ever happening in the first place, right? Well, malocclusion right. is no different. If teeth are, if, if jaws are starting to deform from an early age, if breathing or posture or tongue posture is not correct, then waiting for teeth to get crooked so you can straighten them is much like waiting for a house to be on fire before you start, you know, dealing with it. Instead, you want to eliminate the habits that are going to cause the crooked teeth in the first place and thereby eliminate, if not crooked teeth entirely, then it's, it's uh, severity and, and difficulty in correction. I mean, it's just a preventive point of view. It says that crooked teeth is not fait accompli for a child, that if you can discover the habits that are going to create the crooked teeth, just change the habits. So when, when people are going by the old adage of you don't take your kid to the orthodontist until the baby teeth come out, they're just waiting for the symptom to arise. You know what I mean? Hmm. It's, it's like waiting for the heart attack before you start eating healthy. The best protocol is, is to get braces as early as possible, or is it to do exercises first, and if that fails, then do braces? And how does this all fit together? Or do both? Look, uh, people say, when do you start treatment? And I know that when people ask that question, they're always thinking of it in terms of teeth. Do you start when all the permanent teeth are in, which a lot of orthodontists do, because they can, they can treat the problem faster 
more efficiently with braces by waiting for all the teeth to come in? Or do you wait for some baby teeth to be still be there because you can capture a little extra space for crowded teeth that way? Or do you start in the, you know, in the baby teeth or when some of the teeth come in and all that? But the true answer to that question has nothing to do with the teeth. It's the answer is you address the imbalances that are going to not only cause crooked teeth, but are actually going to deform the airway when you discover the habits. So if a child is having their mouth hang open, if they're breathing through their mouth, if their mouth is open, if the tongue is not resting on the palate, you have to change that behavior when you see it. Otherwise, you're just perpetuating the environment for trouble. And again, the the teeth are really the least of it. The most important thing in getting good facial growth and dental development is helping the jaws grow in a way that the airway will grow properly. Because Mm -hmm. frankly, breathing is the most important thing we do moment to moment. And that breathing behavior is not just at night. It's how you breathe during the day too. What's a simple way for listeners to at least experience close to the proper tongue posture? Like one thing I was thinking as we were talking is if I say a word that begins with the letter N, yeah. I try to make the letter N with my mouth, it seems like my tongue goes to the right spot. But can you give That's listeners right. an example of how to do this? What do they do? Yeah, sure. The N spot is a great way of starting. So the letter, when you say N and even hold it out a little bit, uh, feel where the tongue is on the palate. It's usually just behind the teeth. There's a little bump of skin there where some nerves and vessels uh, enter the palate. And um, we call that the spot or the end spot. Mm. Now, whether you can get the rest of your tongue up on the roof of the mouth will depend upon a few things. Number one, if your jaws are have not grown properly, and that's going to be true for anybody that had crooked teeth, even if they had braces, you may not be able to get your tongue up on the roof of the mouth. Something was preventing that all along. If there's a tight piece of skin under the tongue, the what, what's called the frenum, that may also prevent you from lifting your tongue up to the roof of your mouth. So um, the end spot is a good good starting point. If you can roll the rest of your tongue up to the roof of your mouth, um, then uh, then you're off to, uh, that's a good uh, resting position. Now, the other thing you can do, and try to do this as unconsciously as possible, maybe do a selfie video of yourself, um, drinking and swallowing. If you can see uh, movement of your lips, your chin, your cheeks, or even your neck, uh, when you're swallowing, that's an indication that the tongue is not on the palate. Why is that? Because the tongue is the muscle for swallowing, um, and it does so by creating a seal up on the roof of the mouth. It segregates the food or liquid from the rest of the mouth by holding it up against the palate. And then when the muscles of your throat pull downward, it creates a kind of suction effect, a negative pressure effect and pulls the liquid and and, uh, food down. If you cannot create that seal with your tongue, you're gonna have to find another way to swallow. And we learned this very, very early on by recruiting our lips, our chin, our cheeks, our neck as um, accessory muscles for swallowing. But they are now pathognomonic. In other words, they tell you that you're not swallowing it properly. So those are a couple of things you can look for. And mouth breathing, open mouth posture. Richard, parents should know this. If their children are walking around with their mouths hanging open at any age, if they're unable to breathe through their nose, if their nose is stuffy, even if their nose is not stuffy, if their mouth is hanging open, that is a dangerous posture for several reasons. And certainly if you're sleeping that way, that, uh, that makes for problems as well. How do people find a, uh, a dentist that knows anything about any of this? It's, it seems like they're very rare. So how do you, how well, do you know that a dentist would even look at this stuff? Well, let me say this, that although we are rare at the moment, the American Dental mm-hmm. Association has issued a policy in October of 2017 and is currently um, studying the issue with a number of task forces 
they ha their policy statement has said that dentists are now responsible for helping children achieve an optimal physiologic airway and breathing pattern. And I that's a quote. Okay. And uh, although a lot of dentists yet don't know that much about it because number one, it's not taught in schools. And number two, we're just gearing up to roll this information out to the general dental public at, you know, at large, the profession at large, um, they will be addressing this. If, and if nothing else, they're just going to know how to screen for problems so that they have, when they have, uh, you know, colleagues that do deal with these things, um, they, will, um, they will have somebody to refer to. Uh, my orthodontic okay. association just came out with a white paper stating that we should be screening for airway, or, well, for sleep apnea in children uh, of all ages. And while that may seem like a step forward for that organization, they are still a little bit in, um, uh, in, in denial about how pervasive this problem is and what to do about it. But my hope yeah. is that that's going to change, um, change as well in the near future. One thing you can do to find practitioners is go to a website called aapmd.org um, or its sister website, airwayhealth.org. In, in fact, airwayhealth.org is the one that has the database of practitioners of all kinds that recognize okay. that airway is a critical issue for dealing with in patients of all ages. Mm. What are um, we, we haven't even talked about it, but what are the consequences of a uh, poorly formed airway in children? What do they lead to while they're a child, and what do they lead to, or what could they lead to when they're an adult? Well, any time that your body cannot bring in or process air properly and deliver oxygen to every part of the body, there are going to be consequences, and we know that problems of both daytime and nighttime breathing are serious enough that they can cause all kinds of comorbidities to um, children and adults that can't breathe well. We okay. can start with sleep. Sleep has taken a lot of notice now because we understand that if you don't sleep well, you are not well. Your right. mind is not well. Your body is not well. Your ability to process hormones both growth hormones and digestive hormones is not is not well. We know that people that have trouble breathing at night suffer uh, a lot of stress on their heart and circulatory system. This is why so many people with sleep apnea are dying of heart attacks prematurely in those wee hours of the night. We know that children that don't get oxygen well will sh will suffer brain damage, even if the body does well enough to keep the person asleep and and blood flowing and oxygen getting to the tissues when when the oxygen fluctuates when it dips down a little bit and goes back up and dips down and goes back up things that are not really noticeable to the person or their family you know itself unless you actually look at it that that intermittent hypoxia can create brain damage It'll uh, prevent certain areas of the brain from growing properly. It'll prevent the brain from remodeling uh, properly. That's where, you know, certain cells that aren't being used are pruned away. Um, right. You know, sort of like bones, there's always this give and take of new neurons and taking away old neurons and so forth. And so um, the inability to breathe well at night is critical. And many of the behavioral components, that, uh, problems that we see in children, we think are directly related to their inability to breathe well at night. There's a sleep physician in Chicago, Stephen Sheldon, who was once quoted as saying he believes that 80 percent of the kids that are now being medicated for attention deficit or neurocognitive problems, uh, hyperactivity and, and the like, that they're suffering from a syndrome that is uh, re reflective of the way they're not getting good sleep. I mean, wow. can you imagine? We now have kids on three, at three years, four years, five years of age on Ritalin because their parents or their teachers can't control them. And really what they're suffering from is lack of oxygen to the brain. 
So, Richard, the pervasiveness of this issue, uh, you know, goes far beyond crooked teeth. I, you know, uh-huh. I, I didn't realize, and this is true, that there's so much more that you can talk about, so much more depth to your knowledge. But for now, what's the best way for folks to get in touch with you and ask more questions? And then uh, can you restate the resource of practitioners so people can look and find out more if they have uh, children that have problems or they themselves have problems? So what are, what are some resources for people? Right. So go to airwayhealth.org for a national, maybe even international database of people that have been looking at this issue and have agreed to uh, make it part of their practice. Um, You can find me at uh, alignmind.com, A-L-I-G-N-M-I-N-E.com. That's a holdover name from when I was just straightening teeth, but it has such good uh, ranking on Google. I didn't want to let go of it. Or you can also, um, more than straight teeth is a a secondary website to get a a little bit uh, more of an understanding. Okay. Well, very good. Dr. Raphael, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I certainly would uh, accept another invitation. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.